Welcome, good morning. Uh, I see that by, uh, by, if you're in the room today here, you didn't get scared off by the word Java in the title of my presentation. Um, so I work at Engine Yard uh, on the JRuby team, and I want to talk to you today about refactoring Java to Rails. So when we think about refactoring, usually we we're talking about improving the design of existing code. And when we're doing a refactoring, we're thinking about making incremental changes to an application and changing the code, but not changing the functionality anyway. And that's generally the, the, the approach that I'm taking. But if you think about refactoring, I don't know if any of you have read this book. Uh, there's a, a ton of, it's a classic book, great information in it, but it really applies at a really, really fine-grained level of your code base. So there's no, <laughs> there's no uh, patterns for refactoring, like introduce new language or extract a Rails controller. You know, the, those, high lo those higher level refactorings just aren't some things you typically think about. Uh, and so um, another question you might be thinking about in terms of you know, what uh, to do with a Java application that you want to use Rails for is, well, what, why would you even do that in the first place? Uh, you guys are sitting here at the Scottish Ruby conference, and I probably don't have to convince you that using Rails is a good idea or using Ruby is a good idea. But for a you know a mainstream Java programmer, why would they even want to do something like that? And uh, there's actually a fellow, Matt Rabel, who gave a talk in Belgium last December about uh, comparing various JVM web frameworks. And he he actually had the foresight to include Rails in his comparison, even though Rails technically is a, a Ruby framework, uh, it runs just fine on the JVM with with JRuby. And I'll just mention up front, JRuby 1.6 is our latest release. It just came out a couple weeks ago, and it's probably our, it's our biggest release to date. It supports Ruby 1.92, and its uh, support for Rails is better than ever. There's, Rails runs pretty much without a hitch. Uh, if, you, if any of you are coming from pure Ruby applications to JRuby, there's some other considerations uh, in terms of what you might need to do to change your application. That's not what I'm not going to talk about that today, but I actually happen to have a talk at RailsConf next month that's going to focus on that topic. I don't know if any of you, by chance, will make it there, but you can maybe look online for, for details about that in the future. Um, so I want to talk, again, get to back to this idea of refactoring and, and, and how it fits in the realm of a Java application or a legacy application or an enterprise application. And to do that, I want to introduce a metaphor um, with with the built environment, with architecture. Um, and that's maybe a little bit of a weird metaphor to make because typically, you know, with software, it's very malleable. With, with buildings, you build it, it's, it's done. There's not a lot of refactoring you can do the building. But I actually found a couple examples that I think would apply to this. So when I'm talking about enterprise software, um, I'm really talking about long-running projects, legacy code bases. Those are the kinds of things you think of. So it's, it's code that's already really entrenched and it, it kind of feels, it feels a little stagnated, it feels uh, hardened, not, it's resistant to change. And so what the, the whole idea behind bringing Rails or Ruby into the mix here is to, to enliven the application again and make it able to respond to change more quickly. Um, so to get back to my architecture metaphor, I want to bring up my first example, I want to bring up the Sagrada Familia uh, in Barcelona. I assume maybe some of you have been to see this, this structure. Uh, I myself have actually not been there to Barcelona to see it yet, but uh, hopefully within my lifetime I might be, might be able to, to get there and see it finished. Um, this building is, you know, obviously, it, you, if you know the history of it, it's been in, in construction for, I think, about a century or so, and they still have at least a good, fifth, probably 10, 15 years before they can e even call it, you know, close to complete. Uh, and what's interesting about this building, it's just such a long-running project, right, and so they have all these different facades on the building and they have scaffolding inside of the building to hold up the archways while they're building out new, new facades and new interiors. And uh, just this, I mean, even already, if, like even seeing the word scaffold, right, kind of t makes you think of rail scaffolding right away. At least that, you know, that's kind of the metaphor that I was thinking of there. So you have this building that has all these different faces on it. It's gone through different phases of construction. Um, and you, you could kind of think of software being uh, done in that same way, at least a long-running software project where you're, you're doing multiple things to the project. And at various stages, uh, you might be working on pieces that are only loose, re loosely related to other pieces in the past, but you still have to bring them together somehow. Another example I have is this hotel in North Korea. Uh, I think it was construction started back in the late 70s or early 80s. It's a fairly ambitious project. I think it's like a 
40 or 50 story hotel and it's a really odd shape. And I think back in the mid 80s or so, um, it's probably not surprising that the North Korean economy might, might tank and the, the construction stalled out. And so the thing st stood uh, kind of empty with the, it's a little bit hard to see in, this, in the screen, but it stood more or less empty with no, um, no skin on it at all over here. I, um, and so this is a picture of what it looked like in 2005. And then only recently it was sort of the project was restarted again. You can see they're starting to put a glass skin on the outside. And so um, for this example, you can kind of think of a software project where it might have been moth mothballed for a while, and then you need to pull it out and actually revive it again and actually do something to it. Another area that's interesting is um, this idea of a seismic retrofit. Uh, these are buildings that have been retroactively um, reinforced to withstand earthquakes and other, you know, other um, natural disasters and that kind of activity. And this is a picture of a couple buildings in Ber Berkeley, California, where they've had these these cross brace struts applied to the outside of the building to, to reinforce them because uh, when they were originally built, uh, the, the technology for withstanding earthquake, earthquakes wasn't what it was. And so later on, technology progressed and they are adding these extra structures on the outside of the building. So um, I found that kind of interesting. And then fi my final example, this, this odd structure in Krakow is a, an, another sort of ab abandoned building that probably never will be finished. Uh, and yet, uh, it kind of stands on a, as an eyesore on the Krakow skyline, skyline, but actually it's been kind of repurposed recently by H&M and some other advertisers. They put these huge billboards on the side of the building. And so that's kind of an example of, well, the project's kind of dead, it doesn't really do anything, but maybe you can still do something useful with it. Um, and so to kind of summarize all these, I'll just kind of uh, click through all of them real quickly here. I mean, I think I kind of give, gave you some idea of how um, each of these structures has, you know, sort of a history behind them, uh, various phases of construction, and you can think, you can kind of draw parallels with software, with um, building new parts of the application, scaffolding, uh, reviving old projects. Um, the size and retrofit, retrofit is kind of almost like you could think of it in terms of like a security audit, or you, you know, you want to improve the security of an old application and by adding, adding it. In, and um, and the, the, the Skeletor example with finding new uses for old code. And so all these areas are areas where uh, you can add Rails into an, an application and quickly spin out new features. And I'm gonna show you today how you can do that without, ha without having this you know, completely disturb um, your existing application. And so I have this uh, repository on GitHub that I'm actually just gonna uh, pretty much step through today. And it'll, I'll kind of have an extended demo and we'll just kind of browse through the code and I'll try to give you some examples of some of the things that I did. In it. So the idea I have with this repository is it's basically a, it's probably spans about 30 commits or so and it starts with a, a, a basic uh, Spring MVC application that uses Hibernate. It's actually the Spring Pet Clinic if you've ever seen or heard that application, um, which is a little bit generic and a little bit small. I, but, and, um, it's at least something I could work with and something that was readily available that I could use. Um, so the other comment I have about um, my approach here today is that I w I'd like to be standing up here g uh, giving you sort of a experiential report about how I, how I did this to a real world application. I don't have that today, but I, I do know of some people in the community who have done this and I, I just haven't convinced them to step forward and talk about it or we haven't like put our heads together to say, you know, let's. Let's get the word out. So my main idea with this example today is really just to be um, sort of a clean room. You know, if I were to do this, here's how I do it, and it's out here in a repository, well documented, uh, step by step. And the hopes is that people, you, you guys and other others, can go look at the repository and browse through it, browse through all the commits, and learn about um, some of the things that I did to introduce Rails into a Java application, and so it can provide a, a way forward, if you will. Um, the, the prerequisites are pretty small, and if you're already doing Java coding, you probably have most of these. Um, you might need to install JRuby if you don't have it. There's a number of ways you can do that. Um, you can go to jruby.org. There's a download page. You can get it through RVM if you use RVM. And then, and then of course, you just need Git because the, the, the project is in a Git repository. So the way I structured the, the, the refactorings was to, to do it in sort of in three phases. I did a small, medium, and large refactoring. And the reason was for this was to sort of give you different options for how you might proceed in, in your application. So if you want to just do a small amount of changes, you don't really want to affect the existing structure of the application, the way it's laid out, the project, the way it's built, those kinds of things. You might just consider some of the things in the small refactoring. 
And then the medium refactoring builds on that and adds some more functionality in and starts to take over more of the old application. Then the large refactoring actually goes full scale all the way to completely replacing uh, the spring MVC, MVC parts with Rails parts. So we're going to step through all three of those, hopefully, in the time we have here today. Windows got resized again, so hopefully you can see that all right. So um, on the left side of the screen here, you can see sort of the basic project structure. It's just a normal Maven, um, slash Maven Java application with a source, and you have your Java code and your web app code in here. Um, and what I, the first, so when you're doing a refactoring, uh, what's the one thing you really don't want to, you don't want to be caught without when you're doing a refactoring would be um, some sort of a test suite. Uh, you want to be running that constantly and making sure that you're not breaking anything as you go along. And so um, my decision for, I, 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 I chose to build out a small Cucumber um, set of Cucumber features that test the application through, through uh, HTML unit uh, to verify that the web pages are all serving up correctly. But we can actually look at, if you haven't seen the, the Pet Clinic application before, I should have it running here. Um, it's very simple. It's got um, owners, veterinarians, and pets, and visits are the main entities in there, and you can um, look at a list of veterinarians, um, search for an owner, look at an owner, and look at the pets and how many times the pets have been to the, to the clinic. Uh, so that's the basic functionality. There's not a huge amount of stuff here that needs to be replaced, but... Uh, okay, so the first thing we want to do is I want to... Um, I want to change to my cucumber. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm going to be just stepping through this, this Git repository here. This is a list of all the, all the commits here. Um, so the first thing I did is we have the cucumber suite, and so I can actually run it. And so I've got the Cucumber Suite set up to boot the Tomcat web server uh, using Maven. It'll stand by and wait for that to finish. It takes a few seconds. And then it'll run the Cucumber Suite against it with, a, with HTML unit as a head, in a, sort of a headless browser mode. If, you've, if you're um, familiar with Cucumber, you know there's a bunch of different ways you can test web apps with it. And this is using uh, the Capybara gem uh, and, and Celerity, which is a wrapper around HTML unit. And so I'm running the Cucumber features here, and some of them are failing. Uh, that's because the way I wrote the Cucumber suite was uh, in such a way that it, it couldn't, uh, the only way it could find the some fields in the form was through having label tags that didn't previously exist in the, in the Spring application. Uh, so um, I actually add those in here. So there's actually a revision here where we um, add, we add these tags uh, label tags around uh, around the labels, and that's what that's what uh, Capybara uses to to find those fields, so it can do the fill, fill the form form in. Um, so if we switch, uh, the first thing I did um, another. So after I had the cucumber sweep completely green, we'll just skip that for now because I'm be running cucumber again several times here, and you'll see it green eventually. Uh, the, the very next step after I had the cu Cucumber Suite was to actually bring JRuby into the mix. And it was actually very simple. With a, Maven, um, with a Maven project, you just have to declare those jar dependency jars, and JRuby has those available. And then I simply added a small amount of code inside of the Java application's web XML file where you configure what, what servlets and, and context listeners and so on and so forth are, are in the web app. So when that's there, um, let me just change to this one. Uh, 
Um, so now the so the application is still running. Oops, not there yet. So here's the application yet again. But now, if I go to this rack URL, you can see I've put the, a little rack application, that, the little lobster application that comes in in the rack distribution. So we've actually wired in JRuby here, and it's serving a little wrap at, rack application here. And you can see the rack, the rack mac, uh, machine going here and the, the, uh, the show errors, um, middleware, rack middleware that's coming through here. So in one, one small step, we haven't altered the, other, you know, the, the rest of the application. We've introduced Ruby at a new endpoint inside of the existing app, and now we can start to do some things at that endpoint. Um, so I'm going to, next I'm going to actually switch to Sinatra. And so if we look now in the application, we have actually We actually have a little app RB in here. And here's, our, here's a little Sinatra app that I'm now going to run, run in the web app. I have to restart it. All right, so now when we go back to our, our um, application, we see this little Sinatra app was running. And um, I added some code in the Sinatra configuration to include the Sinatra lo reloader gem, which allows you to change, change the Sinatra routes and actions and views on the fly. So I can do things like um, I can actually make changes to my app RB file and go back and refresh the browser and the changes take effect. So our, this is obviously dem demonstrating another aspect of working with Ruby or Rails is that, that quick, quick feedback mode of, of operation. Okay, um, okay so now we're actually gonna start to modify the application, existing application. And what I'm going to do is um, I'm actually going to go into one of the JSPs. Um, see this here. Uh, you can see that I'm going to go in the JSPs and I'm actually going to change one of these XML links to point to the rack application. And so uh, what I'm kind of, the idea I'm kind of introducing here is that you could bring in something like Sinatra or uh, some other lightweight Ruby framework, and you could use that to implement maybe some, some services around your existing Java application. Of course, you could, you could also pull in Java libraries to, the, to do that as well, but you know, Ruby makes it nice to do that kind of thing, to serve up web services, to serve up JSON, and so on. So let's try this. So I'm going to go back to the Cucumber suite now and run it. And there should be one failure. Okay, and there's a, there's a failure. So what I have is a, um, I believe it's in this, this, this feature, uh, Cucumber feature here, um, this feature of the vets page where you can view the veterinarians list as an XML document. And so this is, this is the one that's failing right here. I believe it's this step right here. Oh, it's saying then I should see an XML document. So, um, 
we replaced the link, the link goes through to the Ruby application, but because we haven't actually implemented the XML link yet, we're, probably there's some error page being returned. Um, and so, going back to our Sinatra app, we see that we'll have to add a route in here for that XML page and actually, actually implement that. And so, to do that, can actually go in here and I, the next commit in the, in the repository implements the XML feed. And I'm just using Builder here to build out the XML document. Uh, there's a method in here, or uh, there's a method in here called clinic that's getting called. And this is actually a Java class. It's in the It's actually in the, the pet clinic Java code. We can actually look at it over here. And this gets into how JRuby has really nice Java integration. So we have this clinic interface that we're, we're, we're uh, pulling out of the spring context. And the, the clinic has this get vets method right here to get the list of, of, get the list of vets. And then I have in, in this directory, I have a, a helpers class for Spring. And you can see here's the clinic method here. And all it does is it gets a handle to the, the Spring context and then kind of indexes into the Spring context and pulls out the clinic object by name. You can see here on this line up here, I'm declaring the context by just pulling into the web application context and pulling out the Spring context that gets stored in a particular place in the server context. Um, I also have an interesting little helper up here. I'm declaring these methods on the Spring Bean factory that allows me to use square brackets, the square bracket operator to, to do sort of the equivalent of a hash key lookup into the Spring context and treat it just like a, you know, syntactically just like a hash map, which is kind of nice. Uh, so that's our, um, that's our vet, that, VETS XML implementation. And now if we go back and run this again, um, that, that, that scenario should be fixed. So while that's running, let's go back and, and um, kind of move along. All right, so, um, we can, so we can kind of proceed in this manner. We can make small changes to the existing application uh, that break a test and then um, fix that test and then just keep going stepwise through the application. That's kind of what happens here. Um, Eventually, we get to the point where I've got, let's see, here's the test suite running. Yep. So all the, all the tests are, are passing now. Um, so to take this, the small refactoring sort of to a logical conclusion, um, let's, get, let's collapse this back down. You can, um, Go back, if we go back and look at our Sinatra app now, you can see I've added a couple more, a couple more actions here. There's a JSON action, and then there's also another, another XML uh, document below. And I'm using Builder, and I'm actually, I've actually extracted the Builder code out to separate Sinatra views to kind of clean this up a little bit. So, I mean, that's just more of an internal refactoring, but it makes this code cleaner and, and easier to read and easier to maintain. It streamlines it. Um, so... So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from here into the, the medium refactoring. And the first thing we do in the medium refactoring is um, I'm, I'm going to change the mode for mode of operation for JRuby inside of the web app. So before it was running as basically a servlet at a particular endpoint in the application. And I'm going to change that to this filter right here. So if you're familiar with the servlet API, you know that there's servlets and filters. And filters are, are sort of analogous to rack middleware, where you can kind of wrap filters around um, the request pipeline and intercept them at any stage. And so moving this, uh, the JRB integration to, uh, to use a filter means that we can intercept all the requests going into the application. We can decide which ones we want to handle. 
And so I have this class that I wrote, um, which basically what, what, how it works is a request will come in and Ruby, the, it will delegate that request to the Ruby code and allow it a chance to, ha to handle that request. If the Ruby code says, nope, I don't know anything about that, it, it'll throw back a 404 error or maybe some other kind of error. And then the filter will turn on and say, okay, well, the Ruby code didn't know what to do with it. I'll just let the regular Java application handle it. And so what this will allow us to do is we can start to incrementally layer new Ruby um, actions on top of the existing application uh, without having to disturb um, any URLs or anything in the application. But we can start to implement them in Ruby, and that will just automatically pick up. Um, let's, let's see that in action here. Um, so after I've done this, the first, the first step I introduce is to go back to our um, Sinatra app. And instead of saying get rack vets XML, I'm actually going to overwrite or replace the, the uh, the, the vets XML uh, path, which is the, it's the same path that the Spring ap application would normally expect to use. And so if we do that, um, well, first of all, if, if we do that, now we've changed the URLs in Sinatra, Sinatra, so the existing Spring app is still expecting to go to rack um, vets.xml, for example. So it's not going to work. But in the following commit, then, um, oh, actually, that is the commit that I do it. Um, OK, I uh, must have lost that in here. Oh, I did do it in this commit. OK, so in a previous commit, what I did was, sorry about the confusion here. In a previous commit, I'm sorry. In a previous commit, I actually changed the URLs back first before implementing the new actions. And then in another commit, I implemented the new actions at the right place, thus making the test run again. So it was, again, sort of a red-green refactoring step. Um, so at the next point in the medium application that I want to go to is I actually want to switch from Sinatra to Rails. I'm going to start to do some more, um, more heavy, well, I don't know if I say heavyweight things, but um, we want to start to build out the application in a larger fashion and just feel like Rails is a better way for organizing all the various routes. Um, so you can see here now I've actually added uh, some Rails guts into the, into the mix here. The Rails application app directory and the config directory. And then later on, we can uh, actually go and implement um, we're going to go back and move our Sinatra code over to Rails. So I'll do that here. And now we can see that uh, we, we, have a, uh, we have some routes. Uh, so we're, we're adding the routes into the Rails application here. And we have a controller, some controllers for this as well. So you can see I've moved the, the, um, the XML and JSON handling code that was previously in the Sinatra application. I've moved it over here. And you can see I'm using a Rails respond to. Um, block to do the to to to, to do the um, format handling in the same in the same action. Uh, yeah. So at this point, I haven't actually changed the model layer of the of the hybrid of the Spring application at all. So maybe I'll stop here and just show you that if we. Um, so at this point, yeah, that's a, that's a good question to point out. So the, the Spring application is still running inside the web app, and I can access it like I showed you before by kind of reaching into the Spring context and pulling things out of it. And uh, at this point, we've just been doing uh, basically controller and view type stuff. So of the, of the MV, you know, MVC3, MVC3 uh, parts of the application, 
the MVC, we've just been doing views and controllers and we're just keeping the model code completely as it is. And I think that's probably a good model in general for this kind of application where you've got an existing body of Java code or probably has some business logic embedded in it and you probably don't really want to change it or wholesale rewrite that. And so this is just kind of showing how you're, you're layering these, these on top. And so I think So, yeah, so this is just, it's, I don't have anything specifically that says that this is coming from Rails, but you kind of recognize things like the runtime header and the fact that there's application XML here. And it's just running through the Rails and the, there's a, um, um, there's an index XML builder here that has the has that build has that builder code in it. All right, so got a little over thirteen minutes left here. Um, at this point, I actually want to move some of the actual HTML views into Rails, and so what I've done to do that is, for example, what I'm doing next is I'm introducing a, a new route. Um, you can see at the bottom here, I've actually added a root route, which will make the welcome page of the app go through Rails this time. And uh, there's a welcome controller as well. It has an index method. It's not really doing anything yet. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take the contents of a, of a JSP and just wholesale move it um, over into the Rails app, which doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, so we have a if we look at the welcome, we have a we have an index, okay, that's the, that's the, that's the finished version. No, let's see. Okay, so what I wanted to show is, um, What I want to show is that I am starting to take some of the content out of the JSPs. Um, and for example, putting it into the Rails application layout. Um, and I make one small modification and I just do that so that we can visually highlight that, um, that, uh, that the, a page is being served from Rails versus from the, the, the Spring MVC portion of the application. I'll show that here in a moment. Just waiting for the server to finish booting. Let's see what else. 
All right, so you can see, <clears throat> this is what I was talking about. I, I added an, a new graphic just for, for the Rails portion of the application that says, okay, this page was served by Rails. And I included that, that background image in the Rails version of the layout. But the spring layout <clears throat> remains without that. So if I click into a, into a page that's still served by spring, that one's actually served by Rails here too. Um, if I click into a page that's still served by spring, you can see the Rails image in the upper corner goes away. So um, this is just sort of a visual reminder to say, okay, well, this page is still done by spring, but this one is actually served by Rails. Um, so this is an interesting thing here. I have one page that's being served by Rails, and it serves up this search box. And if I go and then click and submit the form, then it actually submits the form to the spring side of the application. Um, and I think this, this kind of demonstrates the power of just sort of, sort of segregating your application according to URIs and thinking in terms of pure, uh, pure paths and endpoints in the application. And the, and the fact that you can take a form and serve it, serve it um, from the Rails application and submit the form to Spring um, is, I think that's kind of a, a, a powerful concept for demonstrating how you can just sort of incrementally change, change the application. All right, so um, I know Skip ahead now to the large refactory, and the, and the, the main crux of the large app, uh, refactoring, what I want to do is I want to actually move the, so you saw before how we had all this Rails code uh, embedded down, kind of deep down in the, let's collapse this. All this Rails code kind of embedded deep down in the guts of the project, and it's, you know, it still has a for, sort of a traditional Java feel to the, to the structure of the project. Well, what I want to do is, um, actually pull that code out up to the top level and just make it a proper Rails project. So we can use, we can use the Rails server, we can use um, Rails generators to add new, new features to the app, we can do anything in a more Rails-like uh, development mode. Um, so let me check that out. And now you can see I've got um, I took all this stuff out of the web app, and instead now I have my, it's actually not up here yet, but. Yeah, I haven't actually moved the, um, the, 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 the code in there yet. But um, you can see now it looks more like a proper Rails app structure where you have app config, lib, script, uh, test, vendor, and that sort of thing. Uh, the, so, now what we're doing is we're actually changing from running in a mode where we're running the app in an embedded Tomcat container. We're going to switch to running the app with the Rails server, which, which is WebRick by default. So um, we're kind of moving more completely out of the Java web app space and into kind of a pure Ruby app space. But because we're still in JRuby here, we can still do Java things. But now we actually have to do, we have to do one thing um, ourselves now that we got for free from before, and that's to um, um, actually boot the spring, we have to actually boot spring ourselves from in the, within the web app because there's no, it's not that stuff, it normally happens within the, the spring context listener, but now we have to, to do that work ourselves. There's obviously no, you know, at least not today, there's no plugin for Rails that, that boots spring automatically for you, although you could possibly take this code and make one from it. Um, so what I've done for that is, um, In <clears throat> config initializers, there is this spring class here. And you can see all it does is it adds some file, it, it basically sets up this spring class path XML application context. And, it, and that's, a, that's sort of a way of, in spring of saying, well, here's my spring configuration files here. Um, just boot this up, um, finding those files on the Java class path instead of the. The, the normal spring web app uh, way of doing it. And you can see here I have the spring um, application context files here. And I just um, um, make sure that those files are on the class path, they'll get loaded up. Now, the other big issue we have is that we have this big spring application. And if you look at the, um, the Maven project file for this, you're going to scroll down it, you're going to see all of these dependencies, log4j, Apache stuff, MySQL, Hibernate, um, we have all these jar files, how are we going to manage this stuff? Well, we can actually just use, the, use Maven and make Maven go to work for us on this. Um, I wrote a plugin that's in the 
the la latest version of JRuby that you can use today. And what it does is, um, you can see it here. You just run a, a, a Maven command line to call out to this, uh, this JRuby plugin that I wrote. And it, and it generates this script that we're looking at right here. So you're in a Maven project. You run this plugin. It generates a, a sort of a class path script for you. And you can see here, it's basically it gives me a list of all of the all the jar files that belong to this this project, and then I can actually just call that set class path method to set up the class path for me. Um, so we'll, we can see that here. Um, let's go to this one. Now we should be able to do Rails server. And so here's the Pet Clinic app served up by Webrick, um, completely within the JRuby process. Um, I set up the I set up the logging for this so that there's there's actually um, you actually see the you actually see the Spring Goo you actually see the Spring guts when it boots up it goes into the separate log file so it doesn't clutter up the console when you're running tests but it's there if, if you want to look at it. Um, so yeah, so that's, we have that basic application running now. If you start to, to navigate into it, um, I don't have all the actions implemented here yet. Um, we, we start, so we started to implement some of the actions up to this point uh, back in the medium refactoring. And then at some point, I just decided, well, let's just go over to this, this other mode. And now we'll just implement the remainder of the features of the app um, in, the Rails, in the Rails way of working, th working things. Um, so I'll um, I just have a couple minutes left here. I'll show you that um, uh, one example of some of the neat things you can do once you get into the kind of really leveraging Rails in the application. What I've done is there's a, in the app model, oh, that should be some, yeah, there we go. In the app models directory now, there's an owner, RB. And what we actually have in here is it, we have a model. It's actually just the same owner Java class that we have from before. You can see the very top line, it says Java import, you know, our pet clinic owner class. And then uh, I simply reopened it on the Ruby side and I add a bunch more stuff in it. So you can see I've added the active model stuff here. Um, I've added some validators for the, for, the, for the owner. And so we can actually take an existing Java class, mix in active model and use it within Rails just as we would expect. And it feels like a, it feels almost like an active record object. I mean, not quite, but but pretty close. And I can just. Is going to be happy about that, so it's uh, well, um, I guess so. This is where it starts to get into the more destructive amount of changes, right? Because we're starting to put validation logic might be something that would have been in the Java layer before that we're now putting at the Rails layer. Um, so if you you know if you screw up your validations, you could potentially be storing bad data. But um, as far as would Hibernate be happy, it's not, um, I'm not, I guess I'm not sure what you mean. What, not be happy in what sense? It will be persisting like Hibernate. Yep. So, and it will take that this folder, as opposed to kind of initially, it could be just a pure Java object. Yeah. So oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, well, so all these extensions that you see here only exist in the Ruby world. Like, so if you think of there being two different you know, worlds inside of the VM. There's, there's the Java version of the object, and the Ruby version of the object is only seen by Ruby code. So when, when you pass, when you do something to this hibernated object and you operate it on the Ruby side, this code is there. But when the that object is operating back in the Java world down in the guts of Hibernate, it just looks like a regular, like a, like a regular Hibernate Java object. Does, does that mean you Right, so you, you, you would have to actually make structural modifications down at the Java layer still. Um, so.
Uh, so, I mean, this this goes you know pretty far into it. Like, the next step would be to say, well, you know, do we do we want to stick with Hibernate at all? We could just at this point we've got the, a shell of an owner model with all the logic that we need, and we could almost go and replace it with Active Record. And I think. If, the, if your database is structured well enough, you might even be able to, to do that. And I've talked to some people who say, say that they were able to actually have an existing Java uh, model and an active record model both talking to the same database table. Now, I wouldn't recommend writing through both of those channels, but you know, maybe if you're reading through both of them, that would work fine. Um, so I'm kind of out of time here. Um, I wanted to just point out and say that this is um, I encourage you to check out the repository if you're interested in this and check out the details. And if you find them interesting, let me know um, if I, they can be improved. This is obviously only one way of doing it. Um, in fact, there's some other um, people that are doing things uh, along these lines. LinkedIn is doing stuff with, with Ruby in their, in their Java apps. Um, there's some videos uh, on the NGN Yard site that talk about this. Um, a couple of people have also done these kinds of things before. Um, and then I just want to point out that I, we just finished a JReview book, and I actually have some copies downstairs you might have seen, so check that out if you're interested. And um, I'll be around for the rest of the day, so please hit me up for questions. Thanks.